This is the last of our Physics 12 final exam review videos. In this one, we're going to take a look at the process of graphing physics data and how we can manipulate some of the axes around in order to get everything to graph in a nice, beautiful straight line. And it all comes back to that beautiful straight line equation from Math 10 when we had y was equal to mx plus b. And in that situation, this variable over here was your up and down variable, your vertical variable for your vertical axis. It was changing, so you had to have a table of values because there were so many of them. And after the equal sign, we found a term where at the back end of it, you had your across axis. And again, it was a changing thing. You had to have a table of these values. Uh, that was going to be your across axis. And then the other two things in Math 10 for any given question that you were drawing were constants. We had m, which was the slope. It was one number for one graphing question. And then you had your y-intercept, which we won't even always have in Physics 12 for our graphing questions. But if it's there, it's going to show up on the right-hand side at the far end of the question. So this first one here, let me just kind of show you how I'm always thinking about y equals mx plus b when I do this. It says the kinetic energy of a small bike was determined at various velocities, and the following data was recorded. So right away, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, oh, well, what's the physics behind that? it's definitely going to be kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared and I can see down below we're going to be doing a graph you know some sort of graph with kinetic energy up and down and something going across uh, but it's not going to be v because that would actually be kind of a, a curved looking graph so I'm going to rethink this and say you know I can take my physics equation kinetic energy that can be my up and down axis and that's equal to and here's where I start rethinking the math. That could be equal to one half the mass of the bike multiplied by the velocity of the bike squared. And then there's nothing else I need to add. It's like plus zero. So yeah, I'm going to go and do a graph here in a minute. And it looks like I'm kind of forced to, down below there, have kinetic energy up and down. OK, great. Uh, I'm not going to graph velocity going across. It turns out that would actually be a really bad idea. I'm just going to sketch what you'd see right here. If you were to say, oh, well, how about we just went with kinetic energy up and down, and then the velocity of your bike this way, your graph would actually be parabolic. It would actually look like that. It's just not straight. We can't go and find slopes off of that very nicely, not without calculus. So instead, we want to rethink this and say, well, how about we actually, for an across axis, don't graph v, but what if we were to graph this, v squared? That could be your across stuff. And then it does have that feeling of y equals mx plus b. In fact, your slope, if you want to think back to grade 10, is actually all this stuff that's constant and multiplied onto your sideways axis. So this is going to be your slope in this story. It's not actually the mass of the bike, but half the mass of the bike. And it looks like we are, we are going to have no y-intercept. It should actually, oops, it should actually go and hit the origin. And so that's why some of these questions have an extra little courtesy column where you can go and work some numbers out. And I definitely need to do that. I do not want to be graphing v. I want to be graphing v squared. So I would take each one of these numbers one at a time, and I would be going, OK, well, what is 1.4 squared? Oh, OK, that's 1.96. And I would do that each time for these and say, OK, 1.96 could be a good number to use going across. Square the 1.6, and you get 2.56. Square the 1.8, and you get 3.24. And you now, you now want to kind of sever your emotional attachments to this v column. We don't want to use it. We want to use the v squared column going across, because we want a nice straight line. So the, the graph that we're going to create, it's not kinetic energy versus velocity. This is actually kinetic energy versus velocity squared. So we've got our v squared axis down there. It would actually have really weird units. Um, actually, going back up to the table here, the V column had meters per second. Well, we'd have to square that. This would be meters squared per second squared. Kind of a strange thing, but that's what it would be. And if I want to be thorough about this, I can go and label this axis that way too and say, yeah, you know what? Be aware of the fact the units here are meters squared divided by seconds squared. Now, I've gone and I've graphed the points for you. Okay, I've ignored the V column and used the V squared, so the points are there to speed things up a bit. Units up and down are joules. And you can see that, indeed, it's a, a nice straight line. It looks like it's lining up with the origin as well. So take a moment, grab a ruler, 
and just draw in the best fitting line you can that's going to go through those points. And I think it, it probably will end up kind of lining up with the origin fairly nicely. So there's our, our trend line, our best fitting line. And if we want to, we could now go and, and find slopes. But if you do go to find slopes, don't use the data points. It's really bad form to do that. Find your own points. So I might go and say, oh, okay, well, how about you know maybe this point here and maybe that point there. You could pick any two you want. You know, space them out, but pick any two you want. But stay away from the data points. So that's that's actually worth mentioning. Okay, so don't use the data points. Not for what we're about to do, because one the one data point that you go to use might be the worst data point of the whole day. Go with the overall trend. Go with a point that's on the line itself. And so you can do your typical little physics 11 run rise staircase there and you can go and find the slope so I'm going to do that just down below here and see what I get for this slope so the slope in this story it's rises divided by runs so it's actually changes in kinetic energy divided by changes in v squared so for my green triangle I've got there it looks like we go from a vertical value of 8 joules up to, oh, it looks like 24. So we've got a 16 joule rise. And going across the bottom, we're going to go from 1 to 3. So that's a, a 2 going across. So I end up with 8. But be careful. This is, you know, an answer you might present. You don't want to have just one sig fig. So at least say 8.0 if you get a nice whole number like that. Now the units. Well, up and down, we had joules. Going across the bottom, we've got meters squared per second squared. Now, that's, that's technically okay, but it's a mess. So you want to actually take that dividing by meters squared per second squared. You want to reciprocate and multiply. You have to at least get rid of the complex fraction. So this is bare minimum here. If you do that, you're going to end up with joule second squared on top of meters squared. That would be okay. It would be fine if you left the units that way. By the way, if people were asking you, oh, well, what do you think the mass was for this small little bike that was going on there? Some sort of little toy bike, perhaps. Um, well, here's what I know. I know that in this story, I know that the slope for this equation, it's not actually equal to the mass. It's equal to half the mass. So if that slope is equal to 8, it's equal to half the mass of the bike. Looks like the mass is equal to 16 kilograms. Now, if you wanted to, you could look at that story again and say, well, wait a minute. If the slope is equal to half the mass, half doesn't have any units, but mass does. Another option for actually talking about the slope is you could say the slope is 8.0 kilograms. It's a bit risky because people might look at that and go, oh, well, is that the mass of your bike? No, that's actually the slope for the graph. Uh, the slope is half the mass of the bike. But technically, joule second squared per meter squared are equivalent to kilograms. So you could do either one of those last two answers for the slope. So we're always trying to turn it back into something we know, back into good old math 10, y equals mx plus b. Example two, an unknown charge q2 is placed various distances from some known charge, Q1. They tell you the value for that. And the force between the two charges was measured and recorded. Okay, so there's so many different distances that they had to have a table. They've got three of them there. And then there's this electric force. So I guess in terms of the story, it looks kind of like this. You know, there's one charge here, Q1. And then there's another charge here, Q2. And there's some force in between them. Well, I know that from Coulomb's law, the equation for the force between those things looks like this. K, Q1, Q2, divided by, if we're talking force, it's R squared. If you just tried graphing force versus R versus that distance, it does not make a straight line. It actually, it's all crooked. It goes something kind of like this. We can't work with that. So we've got to find a way to rethink this and turn it into something that's going to look like a nice straight line. And we can, but we have to think multiply, not divide by r squared. So we could do this plan. We could say, well, how about 
we rewrite this as force, which is changing because we've got so many different R's, is equal to K, Q1, Q2, multiplied by something. And you might look at it and go, well, no, you can't do that. It's divided by R squared. Well, how about multiplied by 1 over R squared? Now what we've got is this. We've got an option to make the force the up and down axis. And there are so many forces that they're all in this table over here in the last column. And for our across axis, we're going to go with this, this 1 over R squared. We're going to have to calculate those, but that could be our across stuff. This is a really important issue. What comes next? All this other stuff, the K, the Q1, the Q2, those are all constant in this experiment. They're not changing. The only thing changing is the R and the value you get for F. So this stuff here, all this constant stuff that's multiplied onto that across axis, that's going to actually be the slope of this graph. So the slope won't be Q1, it won't be Q2, it's actually going to be this product of KQ1, Q2, which never changes. Okay, looking at this little instruction here, it says label the horizontal axis with a function of R that will yield a straight line and then calculate uh, this function in the table, plot your graph. Um, we just did all that. That function of R, it's this 1 over R squared. That's what's going to let us have a nice straight line. So we need to have in our table here a calculation done of 1 over R squared for all of those R values. It's got kind of weird units. It's got units of 1 over meters squared. Some people call it meters to the negative 2, same thing. So we now need to take our calculator and calculate values for each of those. We're going to have to go and do 1 divided by 0.6 squared. And we're going to have to go 1 divided by 0.8 squared. And we're going to have to go 1 divided by 0.9 squared. And those are the numbers that we want to put in the table. So I'm going to go and put those in. You don't have to write down you know, a crazy number of digits, but I've got to put those in. So I'm going to go 2.78 and 1.56 and 1.23 and at this point you can sever your emotional attachments to the R column. You don't want that column. We want to go with this 1 over R squared column. And I've put those points in there for you already. Um, this box down here, this is where we can do this labeling. This would be a 1 over R squared axis and it has units. Uh, last time I went 1 over meters squared, so maybe here I'll go meters to the negative 2, right? Meters squared upside down. This graph that we're going to do, it's going to be that electric force from Coulomb's law versus 1 over R squared. And I've taken the time to put those points on there for you already. And yeah, they're beautifully straight, lined up with the origin as well. So now you can take your ruler and you can add in a, a best fitting line there. So we can go and do a little calculation on this. Let's see if we can find a spot that works nice. That's not bad. That's pretty good. Okay, and then I can go and find the slope of that. Once again, you're, you're going to want to find points that are not data points. So you'd be looking around, maybe going with a point here, maybe going with a point, oh, I don't know, here and then doing a slope on that. I'm going to speed things up for you a little bit and just tell you that if you try that out with this one, you end up with a slope right around 42. I know you guys know how to find slope, so let's kind of look at the rest of this question. So you work this out and you find, oh yeah, yeah, we did it experimentally off the graph paper, it got 42. Let's talk about the units. The units up and down are force, they're newtons. And going across the bottom, they are 1 over R squared units. They are 1 over meters squared. So you've got to clean that up. You can't leave that as a complex fraction. Dividing by 1 over meters squared is kind of like multiplying by meters squared. So this could be written 42, and then you're going to have Newton meters squared. That would be an acceptable way to leave the answer. You might see a follow-up question that says, okay, you've got that done. Can you use the work that you've done, use the slope that you found, that 42 number, to determine the size of the charge Q2? Absolutely. Here's what we had. Back up here, the
the slope is equal to k q1 q2. So that's where I would want to focus on and say, okay, I know that for this story, the slope is equal to this, this product of constants. None of these numbers changed during the story. So you could go and put in values. You could say, okay, hey, the slope was 42 off the graph paper. K is 9 times 10 to the 9. Q1, they gave us that. It's at the top of the page, 2.33 times 10 to the negative 3. And then the only thing missing is another constant. It's Q2. I, I, to be honest, I don't know what the answer is. You can divide if you like. It would be in coulombs when you're done. But that's the plan. The slope, it's not equal to Q2, but it's definitely equal to that product, KQ1 times Q2. And this is what physicists do when they're trying to find something like Q2. They would set up an experiment like this, find the slope, and then use that slope in a, in a mathematical way to find the missing thing. All right, third one. Uh, various sizes of applied forces. Okay, so be careful. It doesn't say net forces, right? It says applied forces. Various sizes of applied forces are applied to a 10 kilogram block of wood sitting on a rough floor. Mm, okay, I'm thinking about friction. Uh, and the acceleration is recorded in each case. All right, I've got a little block here where I can go and do some free body diagrams. This story is definitely going to have an applied force. Somebody's pulling. But it mentioned a rough floor, so I might want to think about friction. There's going to be an mg going down. It's going to be pretty close to 100, 98 newtons. And there's going to be an fn going up. They're going to balance. It's, I'm assuming a flat floor. And then there's going to be some friction, right? Some sliding friction. That friction is going to be mu times fn. It's going to be mu times mg. But as far as the physics goes, this seems to be the, the story of the day. Now, they're talking about some sort of table here with applied force in A, and then there's this request down here, can you plot acceleration as a function of applied force? So I guess this is an A versus FA graph. And they've got the A up and down, it's already labeled. I guess the units here would be meters per second squared. And they want to have they're forcing us to do this. They want to have applied force going this way, okay, measured in newtons. Well, let's go and think about the physics for this. I mean, the points are already down on the graph. Let's think about the physics behind this. Got my free body diagram. The next thing to do is good old F net equals MA. Okay, the net force. Well, I got a battle going on here between applied force and friction force. And that's going to equal m times a. Okay, this is a big challenge. Um, we're apparently going to be having a as our up and down axis. That means you have to get this equation rearranged to the point where the letter a is actually all by itself on the left. I could start circling things now, but it's a bit early. You know, this needs to be my up and down axis. And fa, this needs to be your across axis. It doesn't have that feeling of y equals mx plus b, so I've got to do a lot of rearranging. So I'm going to start changing sides. I could say, if I switch sides here, ma is equal to fa minus ff. At least I have the up and down axis on the right side, but I don't want the m there. So I'm going to divide everything by m. I could just put this as a big fraction over on the right, say divide it all by m, but I think it would actually look nicer if I did this. A is equal to 1 over m multiplied by fa and then subtract. Now here I'm going to write it just as one fraction, ff all over m. And it would be totally fair if you were to say, well, why didn't you write it as 1 over m times ff? Here's why. You can, but here's why. I've now got it the way I want. I've got the up and down axis all by itself on the left-hand side. That's required to make it look like grade 10. I then, after the equal sign, have a term that does contain the across axis, and the across axis is at the back end of it. That was required in grade 10 for y equals mx. The x was at the end after the m. There's a constant in front of it. So this thing right here, this 1 divided by the mass, that's going to be the slope of this graph. It won't be the mass, but actually the mass is reciprocal. 
And then over here at the back end, I've got this y-intercept. So this whole thing, including the subtraction, all of this is going to be the y-intercept. I'm expecting to see a negative y-intercept because it says subtract that stuff. And sure enough, the points, they've already been plotted there for you. I don't need to square anything. I don't need to reciprocate anything. I can just use the, the FAs and the As. And I get these points that form a beautiful line. But as you can see, the line has a negative y-intercept to it, right? So go ahead and draw in your best fitting line. It's going to look somewhere, if I can get this to go. That's not bad. Somewhere in there. Yep, definitely got a negative y-intercept. In fact, it looks like the negative y-intercept is around minus 2-ish. So I could go and I could find the slope if I wanted to do that. I kind of know what the slope's going to be anyways. But I could, I could pick some points, you know, maybe here and here. I could go and find the slope. Uh, the slope ends up being 0.1. Uh, it's going to end up being the reciprocal of the mass. And, and sure enough, even that one that I've drawn, it runs over from... 30 to 50, so it runs by 20, and it climbs by 2 from 1 up to 3. So it does have a slope, right? So we've got a run of 20 and a rise of 2. So yeah, the slope of that graph, no surprise that it's 0.1. I don't want to write just 0.1, though, because that's only one sig fig, so you should at least say 0.10. Let's not worry about the fact that it's obviously going to be 0.1. It has to be the reciprocal of the mass 10. Let's talk about the units. Up and down, we're talking about acceleration. So it's meters per second squared. And going across the bottom, it's newtons. But you don't want to leave it that way. You don't want to leave it as a fraction of fractions. That's, that's not good enough. The minimum acceptable way of writing this is to get it as one fraction. So I want to get this all in one nice fraction, and that's going to end up being meters on the top and newton seconds squared on the bottom. Now, if you would like to, you could write that this way. You could say, well, wait a minute, this is the reciprocal of the mass. That's why we had 0.1. Couldn't we write kilograms upside down? Couldn't we say 1 over kilograms or kilograms to the negative 1? Absolutely. If you want to, you totally can. Last request is that we try to find the coefficient of friction. Whoa, coefficient. Okay, well, we know that force of friction is equal to mu times Fn. And in this story, I'm assuming it's flat ground, we've got mu times mg. So when I look at the original equation up here, I can see that the y-intercept is actually going to be the force of friction divided by the m. So I'm going to jump right into this and say, yeah, let's, let's write that down. I know that for this story, the y-intercept, just from looking at that rearrangement of the equation, it's equal to negative ff all over m. And that's a constant. Force of friction doesn't change in this story, neither does the mass. Putting in the numbers, eyeballing that y-intercept, looks like it's minus 2. Did that right off the graph? I can see it right, right here. That minus 2 is equal to minus the force of friction all over the mass. But the mass, I know, is 10. So if I solve that, I end up seeing that the force of friction is 20 newtons. OK, I'm almost done. I'm getting close. But now I want to go and actually find the coefficient of friction. So that's where you could say, oh, OK, well, we know that force of friction is equal to mu mg. Probably could have done that actually right in my first calculation, but I'm just taking my time. So 20 is equal to mu times 10 times 9.8. So yeah, we can get there. It's not going to be that hard to do. 20 divided by a 10 and dividing by the 9.8. Okay, point, point 0.20 should be fine. So there we go. Mu is equal to 0.20 no units for that. So let's look back at the important part of this. It's all right here. Taking that equation and rearranging it until it feels like grade 10, like y equals some slope multiplied by the across axis and then possibly a b 
on the end. We're always doing that. That never changes. So we've got one last one. Let's take a look at this one here. This one brings in some electricity and magnetism. Uh, it's kind of a contrived question, but uh, we'll play the game. A uh, small spring scale holds up a conducting bar in a magnetic field. So, okay, I get it. There's this bar hanging down, some little coils here so it can kind of move around a little bit. Um, the resulting measurements from the spring scale and the current in the bar are recorded. Okay, so there's some current flowing in this, this bar here. It looks like it's going to the right, I guess, if it's coming down that left wire and up the right wire. And they're suggesting that the spring scale is going to show different numbers depending on the current that you have flowing. So the spring scale is responsible for holding that bar up. Let's turn this bar into a free body diagram. We're going to have the spring scale pulling upwards. The bar is heavy. It's made out of some material. So there's going to be definitely some mg pulling down. But there's also one more force. This question here brings in the idea from this chapter of, hey, there's a force on a wire that's got current when it sits in a magnetic field. And if you go and grab this wire, like maybe right here, grab it with your right hand, thumb pointing to the right, magnetic field coming out at you, out of the paper, your force finger, your middle finger, actually points this way. So there's going to be an LIB force going down. And as the eye goes up, well, that down force goes up. So the spring scale has to respond. And that's why we see a bigger force from the spring scale when the current gets bigger. Okay, well, let's get the physics just kind of rolling here. Um, just balancing forces up and forces down. It's like chapter four. I would have force from the scale up has to equal these downward forces, has to equal mg and lib. So now I want to start looking at it and going, okay, well, well what are you changing here? Um, we're changing the I. We've got so many different I's that they're in a table. And we're changing the FS. So many of them that they had to be in a table. It doesn't quite have the right math 10 arrangement yet. It's really close, but it's not quite right. I want that I term to be right after the equal sign. So I would actually take a second and rearrange this. I would say, you know what? For this story, how about we go with force from the scale up and down for our up and down axis. Now I'm going to put the LIB term next and creature habit, I like to put the across axis at the back end of it. So I have my up and down axis here, that's good. Here's my across axis. I like to put it at the end of the term. So I'm going to write this as LB multiplied by I and then add MG. So this is good. It's got the right pattern to it. I've got my up and down axis by itself. Then after the equal sign, there's a term. And that term does contain the across axis in it at the end of it. And then there's some loose stuff hanging on the end. So what I can see is this stuff here, this LB, that is constant. The length of that bar is constant. The magnetic field is constant. That's going to be the slope of this graph. And then this MG on the back end here, that's your y-intercept. So I expect this graph to not hit the origin. And sure enough, it doesn't. Uh, the points are already plotted. Let's get the title and the units on here. The FS, that force from the scale, that's in newtons. And going across the page, we've got the current. That would be in amps. This graph is actually FS versus I. And yeah, it looks like a pretty nice straight line. So you can grab a ruler and you can... Try to get a straight line going in there. I'm going to see if I can do the same. Yep, somewhere in, somewhere around there, roughly. And we could go and we could find the slope of that line. But if you're going to do that, then what you should do is find points that are not data points. Pick your own points. Go ahead, do your slope triangle, and find out what you actually get for that slope. Uh, when I tried that out, I ended up getting a slope of, my, my value was around 0.95. You might get slightly different ones, but I found for that triangle somewhere around there, I had a slope of 0.95. Now the units, they would be the up and down units, newtons, divided by the across axis units, which would be amps. 
Okay, now they've got some follow-up questions down here at the bottom. First one, the magnetic field strength. Okay, well, no problem. Let's, let's go and look and see what we've got. Experimentally, we have got this fact that the slope is 0.95. And according to theory, I can see that the slope is actually equal to this product of L and B. So I'm going to take those two ideas and just put them together and say, okay, that experimental slope of 0.95 has to equal L times B. They want you to find the B. All three of those things aren't changing, the slope, the L, and the B. One minor little electromagnetism issue, the length. It would only be the section of the bar that has current in it. So it's actually just 0.45. You wouldn't want to put the whole length of the bar in. The ends of the bar have no current flowing in them. The wires just weren't attached out there. So what we could do is we could put in 0.95. We could put in 0.45. And then we could find the value for the magnetic field. I don't even know what the answer is. You can go and divide and find it out in Tesla and you'd be totally done. Uh, the weight of the bar, looking back at that theory up here, I can see that the weight of the bar, mg, is actually going to be the y-intercept. And it looks like the y-intercept is around 3. So the theory says the y-intercept is equal to weight, equal to that force of gravity. So I would say that the weight of the bar, just eyeballing that y-intercept, it's, it's right here. It looks like it's 3, but I would say 3.0. You want to have at least a couple of sig figs in there. So three newtons. And that's the end of our, our graphing uh, review. Remember, you're always trying to turn it back into y equals mx plus b. Get that up and down axis by itself on the left. Think about what across axis you'd want. And beside the across axis is going to be your slope.